This presentation is on sex-linked traits and pedigrees. Just a quick review of sex-linked traits. Remember that women have two X chromosomes for their sex chromosomes, and men will have one X and one Y for their sex chromosomes. Each of the genes on those chromosomes code for different traits. For example, colorblindness is on the X chromosome. And the genes that are on the X chromosome and on the Y chromosome are different. So women will have two of every gene because they have two X chromosomes, whereas men will only have one of each of the genes on the X chromosome and one of each of the genes on the Y chromosome. Here's an example problem. When we write the alleles for the parents, um, we have to write the X and Y chromosomes. So a woman is going to be XX. And then we write letters as superscripts at the top of that to indicate heterozygous, homozygous, dominant, recessive, etc. So if we use the letter F here, it tells us that this person is heterozygous and we have to look further down that color blindness is recessive. Well, heterozygous, we're always going to have um, a big and a small. So that would be the alleles for the woman. She has an X chromosome with a dominant and an X chromosome with a recessive. And then the normal man, well, remember that a man is XY. Okay, his Y chromosome is not going to have a superscript because the Y chromosome does not have this gene. Only the X chromosome has this gene. And because he is normal, he's going to be a capital F because color blindness is recessive and this guy is normal. So we have X capital F as one allele for the mom and X little f as the other allele for the mom. And then the man is X capital F and Y. And then you can do this on your own, but just carry them down just like in a normal Punnett square and you can see all of the genotypes for the children. Now, a pedigree is a chart that shows the occurrence of a particular trait from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, within a family. And there are two types of pedigrees that can be done. And it depends on what the trait is that is being studied. If it is autosomal, then the gene is on a non-sex chromosome, on chromosomes 1 through 22. If it is X-linked, then the gene is on the X chromosome. So here we have some symbols that are used in pedigrees. Um, as you can see here, a male is represented by a square. A female is represented by a circle. A mating between a male and a female is represented by a line drawn directly to, between the two. Parents and children together, we have the mating up top, and then we have a line that comes down between them to their offspring. Those are four common ones that we're going to be using. Uh, we don't need to worry about the ones up until the affected individuals. Affected individuals will be shaded in. They will be dark. If an individual is heterozygous for an autosomal recessive trait, they're half shaded in, showing that they are a carrier for the trait. So here we have an autosomal dominant pedigree. If R represents that the trait is present, capital R, and little r represents that the trait is not present, okay, then here we would have the alleles big R, okay, because it's dominant, that means if it is present, it has to have a big R. 
Now we're not quite sure what the second allele is yet. All we know is that it has to have a big R. It has to be dominant in order to be shaded in. So I'm going to go through my pedigree and I'm going to put a big R in front of all of these because I know that each of them has to have a big R because it is dominant. Now, if it is not present, it has to be a little r. And we've learned by now that if it's recessive, it has to have the two little letters. So I'm going to go ahead and label all of my not present family members as little r, little r. Now, in order to figure out the second allele for each of these, I have to look at their children. So in this case, I have both parents that both have a big R. Okay, so that means a parent, this parent could pass on a big R and something else, and this parent can pass on a big R and something else. Now I'm going to go ahead and look here at the recessive. In order to inherit a little r, little r, each parent must contribute one of those little r's. So that means that this parent has to have a little r and this parent has to have a little r. As far as these, we actually cannot be 100% certain if that is a big r or a little r. Okay, if they got their big r from this parent, from parent number one, they could have inherited the big r or the little r from the other parent. So we're not sure. When we're not sure of that second allele, we write it as R dash. And the dash indicates that we're not 100% certain of that second allele. So let's go ahead and continue on looking at parent number four. If this parent passed on a little r here, the other parent also had to have passed on a little r. So I'm able to determine that that's a little r. Now here, where did this big R come from? It could only have come from parent four. What does the other parent have to pass on? Well, the only alleles that they have are little r's, so that has to be a little r. And now I have completed my autosomal dominant pedigree. Autosomal recessive is pretty much the complete opposite, okay? That means that if, if they have the disease, they are recessive. So in this case, the shaded in are going to be recessive. So I automatically know that all of my shaded in are little t's. They're all recessive. So I'm going to go ahead through and just get them out of the way, label them all little t, little t. They're going to be important when determining the other family members. Okay, so the other characteristic is to not have this recessive disease present, or this recessive trait present. So I know that at least all of my non-shaded are going to have a capital T, because they're all dominant. Because in order to have the disease, they have to be recessive, and these guys all don't have the disease. Now, I need to figure out what the second allele is for these. If, so you have to think, for number six, where did the capital T come from? The only place the capital T could have come from is parent number two, because parent number one doesn't have a capital T. So if parent number two contributes a capital T, what is the only thing that parent number one can contribute? And that is a little t. So I know that's heterozygous. Same thing for this. Same thing for number eight. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and go down to 14 and use those parents. Well, the only place that a big T could have come from is from parent number six, and the only thing that parent number five could have contributed 
it is a little t so i know that that is the genotype so i want you to go ahead and try to finish this up yourself and i'm going to move on to the next pedigree so here we have x-linked recessive pedigree if it is recessive they're going to display the disease or the trait so this is a female I'm going to write in XX I also know that they have the disease and that the disease or trait is recessive so it's going to be a little b XB XB well, this is a male so I know that he is XY but the, the trait is not present so I know that he has to have a capital B on his X chromosome okay so the shaded in one should be very easy because they're recessive so this is a male he's gonna be XY it's recessive he's gonna have the little B same thing is gonna go for all the shaded in squares And then the females that have the disease or the recessive trait are also going to be pretty easy because they're going to be X, little b, X, little b. It has to be recessive for them to have the trait. X, little b, X, little b. Now I can use this information to determine the dominance. So here I know it's X, X. I know they have to have at least one dominant allele. And the only place that that dominant allele could have come from is the father, which means that the mother had to have passed on one of her X little Bs, so I've now determined the trait. I want you to go ahead and try to figure out the rest of them by yourself. And lastly, I'll get you started on an X-linked dominant trait. Okay, this time, if the disease is present or the trait is present, it's going to be a capital B because it's dominant. So I know this is XX, and I know that she's going to have at least one capital B, but I'm not really sure of the other one yet, so I'm going to hold off. The father is XY, but I know that if the disease or the trait is not present, it's going to be a little B, so he was pretty easy to determine. It's going to be recessive. Same thing for the rest of the unshaded males. They're all going to be the same. And the female unshaded is also going to be recessive, so we know X little b, X little b. Now again, we use the parents, the children, whatever we can in order to figure out what the genotypes are. So here I know I have an XY. It's shaded in, so I know it's present, so I know that this has to be a capital B. Okay, same is going to apply over here. Now those are done. Now the females are a little bit trickier because we have two alleles. I know it has a capital B because the trait is present and it's a dominant trait, but now I have to figure out what the second X can be. Well, where did this X B, X capital B have to come from? It had to have come from this parent. So what is the, what does the father have to contribute? He has to contribute an X little b, so I've been able to determine that. Now in order to determine the mother, I have to look at the children. Now, we need to look at the male here in order to figure this out because the father has to contribute his Y to his males, okay? So he can't contribute an X, otherwise the offspring would come out as a female. So he has to contribute his Y. So for the other allele, we have to look at the mother. The other allele here we determined is a little b. So now we can say, okay, this is definitely a little b. 
because that's what the mom had to pass on to this male. Okay, go ahead and try to figure out number eight and number 10 on your own.